Just nine days to go now until Inauguration Day and the transition of power. The Bush administration will be history. How will history assess the Bush legacy? Talia Ashuras starts by looking back to his first inaugural eight years ago. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. As always, it was a day for new beginnings. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. On January 20th, 2001, George Walker Bush took the oath of office as the 43rd President of the United States. His presidency and the future of blank slate. That was before this. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. Before the Iraq War, before Katrina swept ashore. Before the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. In nine days, after eight turbulent years, George Bush will leave here and leave behind a radically different country and a changed world. And the wrangling will officially begin over the Bush legacy how this presidency will be viewed through the long lens of history. I think he'll be able to look himself in the mirror when he is done and say, I gave it my best. I made decisions based on, on principle. As a judicial historian looking at what's occurred on his watch, it is almost void of genuine accomplishment. In foreign policy, where he has taken so much criticism, I think the assessment of history will be surprisingly positive. I think that George Bush might very well be the worst president in American history. Because today's historians, including Pulitzer Prize winner Joseph Ellis, get to write the first draft, the Bush legacy seems to be in for a bumpy start. He's unusual. Most two-term presidents have a mixed record. And Lyndon Johnson, one of the greatest achievements in the 20th century was the civil rights legislation. On the other hand, the extraordinary tragedy of Vietnam. Even Richard Nixon opened the door to China and has foreign policy credentials. Bush has nothing on the positive side, uh, virtually nothing. And that's not a minority opinion. In a 2006 Siena College survey of 744 history professors, 82% rated President Bush below average, or a failure. Last April, in an informal poll by George Mason University of 109 historians, Mr. Bush fared even worse. 98% considered him a failed president. 61% judged him, as Ellis does, one of the worst in American history. John Adams, the second president, said that there's one unforgivable sin that no president will ever be forgiven, and that is to put the country into an unnecessary war. I think that Iraq has proven to be an unnecessary war and will appear to be more unnecessary as time goes on. Is the Iraq war the defining component of his presidency? Mm. Well, the, the Iraq war is the defining variable because it was his decision. No one has the illusion that a president is commander-in-chief of the economy. He is not. He is commander-in-chief of the military. And in the end, you wind up getting judged and held accountable for what you're in charge of. And Reporter in Bob Woodward has written four books on the Bush presidency. I've interviewed him for close to 11 hours. One of the questions I asked him was about how history would look at his Iraq war. And he rightly says, we won't know. We'll all be dead. It may look very different in 50 years. Is there democracy, um, more stability? If that's the case, uh, it's quite possible uh, historians who are measuring that legacy will look back on it and say, uh, he did fine. 
when we look around the world, we see all sorts of quiet successes for the United States over the past eight years. Let's David Frum is a former Bush speechwriter, now with the American Enterprise Institute. Regardless of how Iraq turns out, he says, it's not the only issue on the table. We have this rising power of China that has shown a lot of aggression. The Bush administration has managed to avoid confrontation with China, to open the way to a peaceful and normal future for China. And where there have been new governments, from Japan to South Korea to Germany to France, each change of power has brought to power a more friendly government to the United States. One size does not fit all when it comes to educating the children in America. On the domestic side, President Bush claims credit for the No Child Left Behind Act, the prescription drug benefit, and putting a conservative stamp on the federal courts. He's recognized for progress fighting AIDS in Africa. And just last week, he set aside a huge tract of the Pacific as a protected wildlife area. Opinions vary on the impact of these and other programs, but the consensus is Bush's legacy will largely rest on one event, 9-11 and his response to the attacks. At the eye of the storm, he was a very calm person making very methodical decisions. This was a man who met his moment in many respects as a leader. Dan Bartlett, now a CBS no News consultant, was President Bush's communications director and was with him during the attacks. Thank you for making the nation proud. Mr. Bush's greatest legacy, he believes, is that there have been no more attacks on U.S. soil since 9-11 which at the time was not something that was uh, considered to be possible. Many people thought it was an only inevitable that the terrorists who wanted to do harm to the, our country would be successful. I think President Bush was a good man, so infuriated and angered by 9-11 that he put on his ideological blinders and forgot that, um, that we, we have other things we represent, civil liberties here at home, a constitution, global human rights that he started disliking the world community, alienated allies for no reason. Presidential historian Douglas Brinkley, also a CBS consultant, sees 9-11 as a different kind of turning point. But he put all the chips on Iraq, took the entire agenda of a new century, and pushed it all on, uh, played it on, on one number. My fellow Americans, major combat operations in Iraq have ended in the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. The presidents that operate with certainty can be great presidents, but you better be right. To be certain and be wrong is a disaster. There is a handful of presidents usually included in the top tier of historical rankings. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt. So. Where will George Bush fit in? Dan Bartlett believes the debate is still too tinged with partisan politics for any objective measure. And I think the, the politics of the moment, and they've gotten very acrimonious, uh, will slowly fade. And then you can have a more dispassionate view of what did this person achieve? What did, was he trying to do? And, and was that actually right? My sense is it's going to be a more favorable picture. So is President Bush's current low rating among historians just liberal bias? Rice University's Douglas Brinkley doesn't think so. When I'm sitting here telling you that Ronald Reagan and you know Theodore Roosevelt and Dwight Eisenhower were outstanding presidents, these are Republicans. I'm telling you Ronald Reagan was one of the five greatest presidents in American history. I'm not saying that because I'm a liberal. I'm just saying it because it's a fact. But you have to then accept when I'm telling you George Bush is one of the five worst presidents in American history. It's not because I want to stick it to him. He simply failed on the big questions of his day. I'm not going to be around to see the final history written on my administration. The truth is, history's verdict takes time to reveal itself. In his mind, he sees himself a little bit like Harry Truman or Abraham Lincoln misunderstood in their time. And, you know, we're going to have to go to another time to get a really solid historical judgment of that. 
And he's right when he says, uh, we'll all be dead, we won't know.